So let's just start with the presentation. We have Ivan Nechas, who is a software architect in Red Hat, right? And the topic will be dreams versus reality of applied data science in observability. observability space. You can read it here, <laughs> yeah. You can start. Okay, cool. So yeah, my name is Ivan Nechas. I work uh, in a team called uh, Collective Customer Experience, and it, we work on approaches and tools to help our customers have better experience by leveraging the data that our products are sending uh, or producing uh, during the run. So I would like to talk about you know, our experience in trying to leverage the observability data uh, for, for the work that we do and maybe what some, some dreams and uh, reality are. Uh, so I will start with some context, like to, to, to start with uh, something broader. So it all starts with microservices, like where at the beginning or you know, uh, not that far away ago, uh, everything was running as you know, big monolith and people didn't have, they have some problems, they didn't have some others. Uh, and the trend is that we actually start getting the, the monolith split into smaller pieces that run as separate uh, processes. Uh, we run it in containers and we need something to run those containers. So that's one thing. And you know, one thing is running the containers on the development machines. But for production, we actually need something bigger to actually get those containers up and running. And that's why we have Kubernetes. And you know, one Kubernetes might not be enough. So we actually end up with having the multiple Kubernetes clusters uh, for you know, specific customer or you know, in, in some particular area. And we ended up with having to manage the whole fleet of Kubernetes clusters. So in order to do that, we need some uh, you know, good approaches to actually uh, still do it in some sane way. And one thing that can help us with that is the observability. Observability is basically uh, quality of the product or, or, or the software that's producing enough outputs that one can infer the internal state of the software by observing the, the outputs that it generates. It means that you don't need to recompile or re reconfigure the software to actually understand what's going on. So basically the software needs to produce this data uh, on a regular basis and there is some other things that, that need to be uh, done as well. So we basically need to deal with the data that uh, the software is producing and that's what we call the observability. In more in detail, we have four, or at least in our world, we work with four types of observability data. The first one is the metrics, it's basically the time series data uh, that we uh, observe multiple you know, parameters of the system and it, it's usually you know, floating numbers over time. Then we have alerts, which is basically generated by some rules on top of the metrics where if some metric crosses, for example, some threshold, it produces an alert that somebody ideally would look at and try to resolve those. We have, of course, logs. You know, they have been there for a long time in software engineering. And we, uh, one additional thing that we are working with is also the configuration of the system because uh, the uh, services that we are working on it are uh, often managed by our customers, so we need to know, uh, you know how they configure that, especially if they configure something not ideally, let's put it this way. So this is the, the data sets that we are working with. Who we are working for? So like, who should actually benefit from leveraging this data? So one, one uh, particular persona is a tech support, is the people that other people call to when they have a problem and you know, they, need to, uh, they need to help solving those issues. So another type of person is SRE, which is uh, similar to tech support, but instead of people calling to them, it's the systems themselves. And we have also the engineering itself that is actually producing the software that is observable at the end. And since you know, we have data, uh, we have the users, we need somebody that would help them to actually leverage those. That's why I called in the, the, the data scientist that actually should help these people to, to you know, be more effective with, with the data and get, get the job done. So you know, this superpower uh, guy comes in you know, with the data science, uh, you know, everything uh, trained, uh, he, he knows everything around the training models, and now he comes to, uh, to help the, the people. So what, what his dream might be, so, for the support engineer, and by the, by the way, I generated this, this picture with some AI. It, it, this was the DALI service. So the support usually wears a hat based, uh, based on this model. So uh, it's, it's probably for, for some reason. So for this person, you know, what's 
very often done is let's try it with some chatbots. So we will replace the, the people that need to reply to our customers with some chatbot to maybe I don't know, help uh, with, with the influx of, of the incoming requests. For the SRE, uh, what, what we often you know, see or you know, th there is uh, quite a lot of projects around the anomaly detection. So you know, uh, we will observe the metrics when something goes weird, we'll generate more notifications so that you know, the SRE people can solve these pr problems sooner. And for, for developers, we, we don't know yet, but, but we'll see later. So that's, that's the dream. How to get the dream come true? This is you, you need to have you know, multiple steps need to be done from data cleaning, feature engineering, which is basically extracting the right data that you put into the model, training the, the right models, and then eventually presenting it to, the, to your customers in, in the right way. And you know, from the data science, the most interesting part is the data training or, or the model, model training, right? That's the, the generating of, of the artificial brains and deep neural networks and everything that comes with that. So, we, we let the data science guy to actually watch the, uh, the model train. And in the meantime, we'll talk a bit about the reality. So in reality, what seems to be happening is that many times the machine learning projects actually don't succeed with fulfilling you know, its goal. And it's not low number. Uh, based on, on at least this article, it's 85%, which is huge. And you know, we, we've seen some attempts applying uh, that you know, would explain also uh, this uh, observation elsewhere. So what are the problems when you know, coming as a data scientist to, to the projects uh, to help their customers? So the first problem that we see is uh, thinking about the use cases. So uh, when you have a hammer, everything seems like a, a nail for you. And for the data scientists, you know, uh, when, when they train, they, they learn how to do the stuff. They see a lot of problems that can be solved by the data science. And they know specific models that they can use uh, for that. So when they come to the reality, uh, you know, they seek for the problems that can be nailed with the hammer that they have. Uh, and for example, anomaly detection is one of those. So let's talk about you know, the use cases that I was, was talking at the beginning and why I don't think they are the, the best use of our time. So for the chatbots, I'm not sure if anyone had any kind of good experience with, with using chatbots or you know, was really happy that, you know, th that he was talking to chatbots and not to real people. Uh, if, if you do, please come, come later and I, I want to know more details because he would be the first one, for me at least. Uh, anomaly detection, the problem is that the SRE people usually, they get a lot of signal already. And they, you know, they are uh, ma many times overwhelmed by the amount of alerts and everything that is coming from the distributed system. So if you come with anomaly detection that is not really 100% correct, which will never be, then you know, we will potentially just create more noise to them. So it's not really solving the problem that, that they are seeking for. So what they might be seeking for instead is for the support and SRE engineers to actually help navigating with the data. You know, there's a lot of data already in there. Can we get something that actually doesn't helps them see like what are the real problems or you know what they should be focusing on and maybe helping prioritizing them the things. And for the uh, software engineers, uh, we actually found a use case for the anomaly detection there, but there's some, that's something else that, that uh, one would think for uh, originally for. So another problem, so that was the problem of the use cases. Another problem is the data quality, where one thing is the you know, ideal state, another thing is what the reality is. One thing might be just, you know, what are different data types all, you know, I, I was talking about the logs. So, you know, it's in one service, the metrics are in other configurations and in other, like you, first thing that you need to figure out is how to combine these things together. Another thing is the amount of labeled data, especially for the supervised, supervised learning, you need really quality data for training before you can get some, some, some good uh, results out. With observability space, there is actually not much of that available because you know the systems are like changing all the time, uh, so it's it's really hard to to get something really uh, quality in, in this space. And if there are some labels, it still might not be true. Uh, the trend in uh, latest days is that uh, people just you know throw everything in and hope that the, the uh, system will figure out what what to what to use and what not. And the feature engineering is not that, that cool these days. But what can happen eventually is that when 
you train this model and ask it to, to do something for you, like uh, sh showing a salmon swimming in the river, you can get something like this. <laughs> right? Because, like, and it's not that the model would be wrong, it just got the, uh, the, the wrong data. So well, one thing that I would really propose is when thinking about applying machine learning in these kind of projects, limiting the magic that you apply to that, which means you know, how explainable uh, the system or, or your approach is based on the amount of the data you have, the quality of the data, and understanding of the domain. Because if you miss any of those, you risk that actually your results will not be good. So one, one example that we have, or what we work with, so in the anomaly detection, we're actually not looking at the anomaly detection on time series, but rather looking, comparing versions to versions. And this is for the software engineering, where we basically can tell when there is some regression, and we can detect it in the data. We notice that, and we still need to triage. Like, we, we still need to make sure that the thing is, was caused by some defect in the software, in the version, because there are multiple reasons. So uh, once we get this uh, notification, we still need to go a level deeper and see like what was caused by this. So, so uh, I will not go too much into detail, but each line is basically one deployment over time. The red means that it hits the particle problem, the green uh, means it, it was not hitting it, and the tri triangles mean some upgrades. So in, in this particular, ver uh, particular case, we see some upgrades, uh, the orange are the major upgrades where the cluster was green and then you know, started getting red. So this is probably you know, something that we should look into deeper and we see that there is some correlation between that. There was another spike that was caused by, caused by the anomaly detection, but this time it was caused by uh, you, probably one customer or set of customers spawning some erroneous clusters at the same time and it basically caused a spike. In this case, we don't want to notify anyone because you know, this is a normal case. So we need to be able to explain why are we notifying the things. Another example of feature engineering is when work, working with logs, you usually don't want to work with the raw data, you know, the H line, like it's just you know, no machine learning algorithm or anything will get some value out of that and you need to turn the data into something that you can you know, turn into uh, zeros or ones or some numbers. And what we usually do is that we basically take the stream of the logs and we try to extract some templates from that. So uh, there are multiple uh, solutions to that already, multiple papers uh, and benchmarks where some of the tools work better, some, some not. So we, of course, cho chosen the, the best tool that, you know, according to the, the benchmark, and we applied it against our data. So we have two different lines here, uh, seem pretty uh, similar, but one, one problem or one issue is about something about with etcd server, and another, another thing which failed to uh, complete validation. So, you know, at the second glance, it's actually not that similar. Like, they, they have similar structure, but probably talk about different issues. When we apply the, the template extractions, you know, from, uh, that's by default, we get very generic template that basically hiding a lot of information that is actually in the message. So if you then plug this into any model, it will not be able to distinguish between these two problems because you already feed in something uh, that is not, uh, you know, was flattened already. So what we can do is still take the template that we have and do some additional processing, but it needs some, uh, some knowledge about the domain that you know, like how to uh, uh, process the data further that you actually get here. But it means that you need to spend time thinking about what features you get into the models themselves. So uh, to, to wrap up these, these observations, in the standard way, the data scientists, or at least you know, our observations and what also, also we see in, in, the, uh, in the industry is that there's a lot of focus on the model training itself. What I would like to uh, kind of emphasize here that there are many other steps that need to happen, and especially in, in the world where you don't have perfect data, you don't have that much data and, and, and other, other uh, things like that, you don't know exactly about the use cases, you really need to focus more on other steps in this. And there's also some, some heretic thinking here is that sometimes you don't even need the machine learning to get the value out of the data. So think about like what values you could get to, to, your, to your users as soon as possible. And maybe if you don't not apply the machine uh, learning models now, you still gain the, the trust from the users, especially if you are able to get some valuable thing. You learn what they need. You learn how, how to use the data, what data there are, what data you are missing, 
and then you know, eventually like iterating to something where you can involve the machine learning itself and maybe you know, getting even in more, more value, but one doesesn't have to start with that. So you no, know, there are simple things like machine learning, uh, like statistics maybe, uh, and you know, uh, it doesn't look that, that cool, but it can, it can do uh, its job as well. Uh, so I will, I will not, uh, 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 one thing that I want to also emphasize is the, the trust and collaboration between the domain experts and, and the data scientists. Like we uh, can't just work in isolation and, and shoot uh, you know, uh, some ideas and, and trying random models and hoping that it will be used. Really uh, working with, with the domain experts, observing what they need and then trying to find the best solution for them. It's not about using the right model or we, don't, we, we have to use the model. It's about solving the problems for the users. And uh, another thing, or the last thing I want to mention is just a uh, number of projects that we are using uh, during our work. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning it here is that if you are interested into this stuff or you have similar problems to, to work with, I can definitely recommend any of these uh, projects uh, to, to be used and we can talk about it later as well. So that, that's all that I want to tell uh, you today and if there are any questions, uh, I, I'm definitely looking forward to answer them. So do we have any questions? Uh, well, I have a question. Um, you mentioned the uh, log analysis. Um, have you tried embedding on that at all? Uh, I was playing with that before I, I discovered the drain thing. Mm -hmm. And it was not, like I was not getting you know, too far. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah. eventually the fact that the logs are so constrained, you know, that it's not basically generic uh, language model that they generated by templates already uh, it seemed a much reasonable thing is to actually you know, apply something smaller for example drain is not using any you know advanced techniques it's more just you know doing some some basic you know, building some basic tree uh, from that so so yeah I not I can imagine that you know more skillful thing people than I am in in the you know, uh, natural language processing could you know figure out like how to get to some something better, but uh, for me, the explainability part uh, was more uh, important than, uh, than applying the, the embedding. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Three, two, one, probably not. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, so uh, on one slide you mentioned that uh, the Gartner said that 85% uh, the projects fail. I was wondering if we could use uh, machine learning to identify what went wrong. Uh, I don't think so. And well, I was actually thinking about this. And, and one thing that machine learning algorithms will not tell you is, for example, when you feed it some missing data. It will never tell you, or you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you don't tell something to the system, like it will not be able to infer that it's, it's missing it. So that, that those are some of the things that you know, uh, somebody, uh, some, somebody else needs to think about than, than the machine learning. They really depend on what data that fit in. Also, you know, for, the, for the use cases themselves, like you know, if you are solving the wrong problem, it, not, it might not be that they failed with you know, getting from the inputs, the, the outputs that you know, uh, maybe even match the reality, the question might be whether you know, anyone is in need for these answers. You know? So it might be for the, with, with the anomaly detection, for example, where you know, people really are not keen on looking at something more when they have already enough signal right now. So uh, you know, this really feels more like a human problem than, than, than trying to apply the technical, problem, uh, technical solution to that. Last minute for last question. Thanks, uh, great talk. Um, so I was wondering about the uh, anomaly detection uh, that you use for developers. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you, you said that y you are actually running it on separate versions of, of your software or whatever. 
uh, isn't that like too little? Do you have enough enough versions to to train it on or and to run it on? Yeah, like th th that's really a uh, crucial point, and that's why like I would say no, and that's why we need to be really effective on. Uh, triaging the signal, so we, we get more signal that that we would like to. I, I, I would not want to notify, you know, or wake up anyone in, uh, during the night that hey, we, we have this problem, but we need, like, we still need to catch those problems early. Like, and the reason why we're doing that is that this is for the OpenShift itself, and we have, like, when we roll out the new release, we still first go through the fast channel where just a subset of the clusters actually get the upgrades. And you know, what's important for us is if some, uh, something slips the QE process that we catch that early. And it's better for us to just you know, triage some false positives, but really make sure that the, the true positives are captured. So that's why we accept that there is more noise, but given that we, we have a way how to get from that to explain you know, what was happening and being able to uh, process it further, we can actually uh, still use that. And then you know, for some edge cases, as, I, as, I sh as I've shown, we can actually you know, capture that in the, in the training itself and ignore this particular class of problems. So uh, yeah, the, the lack of data might be a problem for uh, doing more advanced stuff, and that's why we need to uh, stick with something uh, more simple. So we are run out of time, so uh, one more applause for Ivan. <laughs>